Hi, and welcome back to another episode of the Big DK Energy Podcast. My name is Danny Kay, or the DK and the Big DK Energy. And uh, I was listening to the song Looking for the Perfect Beat by Africa Bambata the other day. Oh, and speaking of Africa, that's today's topic, or specifically African military history and martial arts. And helping me with that, we have a content creator hailing all the way from Toronto. So he is the Chief Operational Officer of HAMA, which stands for Historical African Martial Arts Association. And so today I wanted to bring him on the show to educate us a little bit more into that subject. So without further ado, please help me in welcoming today's guest, Mr. Adam Myrie. How are you doing? Doing great, man. How are you? Awesome. Awesome. Having a great day. Awesome. And you're making my day much better because I'm about to be educated on a topic that uh, I really don't know much about. Well, hopefully I can be of help. (laughs) Absolutely. So African martial arts. See, the thing is that my mom signed me up for Taekwondo when I was much younger. So not that I studied anymore, but you know, we both studied or study martial arts. So what's the difference that you see between like African martial arts and Asian martial arts? Well, I mean, mostly there are two main questions to address. The first is that um, the idea of African martial arts, the similarly to Asian martial arts, covers a category of hundreds, if not thousands of different fighting styles based on whichever culture is involved. And really, there's two questions. It's geography and it's context. So, for example, you might have sort of martial arts are, how do I put this, a, a way that a particular culture solves the problem of how do you defend yourself and your region, your people, or conquest, how do you deal with that on a one-to-one basis in a combat situation? How do you train somebody to become very difficult to kill, or how do you train someone to be a better killer, depending on the objectives of that culture? Badass. Um, Just kidding. Well, you know, it depends. (laughs) Yeah, it depends. So, I mean, generally, it's a question of geography and context. So, for example, the context of somebody fighting in Mamluk era Egypt is going to be different from somebody fighting in the warring states period in Japan. I mean, in both cultures, you still have a mounted, armored warrior who can fight with a bow, a spear, a sword, and a knife. But the way that they go about that will be different. That's quite interesting. So from what I read on the Hama website, one of the martial arts that you know most well is modern Taktib. And so what it was the culture and a fighting situation around that style? Okay, so modern Taktib is the modern iteration of a martial arts tradition in Egypt that goes back about 5,000 years. So when I say that, I caveat that with the fact that over time, martial arts evolved based on their context. You know, we'll give the example of judo. Judo in the Olympics in 2023 is very different from judo in the 19th century, for example because the context for its application will be different. But the culture that produced it and maintains it and carries the techniques over is basically the same. So Tahti, as an art, existed as far back as the the Pharaonic period. The earliest example is about 5,000 years ago um, on the walls of the Albers and Acropolis. Now, in its origination, it was a method for training new recruits on how to become efficient on the battlefield in a short period of time. The three great disciplines that the average Egyptian soldier would be taught would be archery, wrestling, which is still practiced today in parts of Sudan, and stick fighting. And the general idea with the stick fighting was that you should be able to pick up any weapon about the same size as that stick and use it efficiently. Whether Mm. it is an axe, whether it is a club, whether it is a spear, the techniques should transfer over to any weapon about that size with slight modifications depending on what they put on the end of that stick. And sometimes you'd be the unlucky guy who would just get a stick to go fight with. I mean, it was a very hard stick, but it was still a stick because back in those days, they didn't have standardized armies in the way that we imagine things like the Romans or the Spartans or medieval armies coming from any of the great empires. Uh, It was largely, you have a military class of elites and then you have everybody else who gets shoved off of their farm And then they have to pick what's on the table and whatever they get is whatever they get. And maybe they can kill somebody and get a better weapon later. But uh, that is sort of the idea. Um, Over time, the art kind of moved into the background. So as Egypt was conquered by groups like the Persians and the Arabs, and then while it was ruled by the Byzantines, the martial arts of those particular cultures ended up becoming the default for military training. So Tahtib as an art became a folk art. So that was something that 
the local indigenous Egyptian would practice and would learn, and they would carry that into whatever military career that they went into, but it was no longer part of the military training camps. Hmm. There's some really great footage of Tahtid in the early 1900s. So during World War One, some of the Egyptian engineers corps were actually playing Tahtid in Paris. They were waiting for deployment. Um, I have the video posted on my TikTok. All right. I'll de- um, definitely have to check that out. And so um, over time, it ended up becoming a dueling art. So it was a dueling art. Basically, if you dishonored my sister and we have a have to solve this problem, the community gets together and agrees, okay, these guys are going to have a stick duel and this is going to finish it. And basically, if somebody ends up not making it out alive uh, in that stick fighting context, then the families would agree that nobody would seek revenge because this is where we resolve the issue. Got it. Uh, the Egyptian government um, or the government ruling Egypt in the 19th century, I believe it was in either England or France at the time, I think it was England, uh, basically banned it. And they said, okay, you guys need to stop hitting each other with sticks because if we can't have duels, you can't have duels either. It's done. So then it became sort of a community thing. So guys would get together, they would drink tea, they would play it in the streets, and it then became a way of demonstrating your prowess as a stick fighter. So Mm. a lot of it is, if I wanted to hit you, I could, but I'm not going to. So a lot of it is technically playing with the angles and demonstrating very complex techniques for moving the stick out of the way, finding openings, and all of that is just to demonstrate that you're able to do damage if you actually wanted to, stopping short of actually taking the hit. In modern Tafti, which is the art that was practiced by my teacher, Dr. Adel Boulad, his effort to preserve the art resulted in modern Tafti, because what ended up happening is with the ban, and with it sort of being relegated to what to Egypt's version of hillbillies, um, it basically <laughs> was starting to die out. So it was really only practiced by rural farmers in southern Egypt who, you know, didn't have the best education or access to the best education, were largely still living in their traditional sort of tribalistic ways, etc. And uh, he traveled to the different villages to speak to the different masters, got them together into a council, and then eventually uh, produced the manual for modern Tartib. So modern Tartib is essentially the modernized, repackaged version of that stick fighting art. Wow, that was a lot of information. That's That was awesome. And based on what you said about Taktib, it kind of reminds me of what I heard about how Capoeira came to be. It was like a way for people to practice culture without getting caught, if you will. Also, since you said this is a modern repackaging, my question is, how did you get involved in this? So how I ended up getting involved in it is, is a long story. And it actually goes back to the origination of the Historical African Martial Arts Association. So some years ago, I got into a very terrible car accident. Uh, it was it was awful. I was walking on a cane. My back was all messed <laughs> up. And um, we were doing research. This hammer was starting in, the very, in its very early stages. And so what we wanted to do as a group was each of the members of the council chose a specialization. And the reason we chose a specialization is because we realized that as far as we were aware, this was the first attempt to seriously approach the academic study of African martial arts in tandem with the practice. And we needed to make sure that each member was sort of a subject matter expert, if not at least very well versed in the traditions of a particular art of a particular region. So we each decided, okay, well, I will take this region of the world or Africa, I will take this region of Africa, I will take this region of Africa, and then we each sort of have our specializations. So we have some guys who specialize in the Sahel, some guys who specialize in West Africa, some guys who specialize in Southern African martial arts, some people who specify or specialize in the diasporic arts, like uh, different forms of stick fighting or machete fencing. And so I decided I wanted to do Egypt, and I thought Egyptian stick fighting was really interesting. So I approached Dr. Del Boulad and asked his permission to be his student. And he basically said, all right, you can be my student. Your job is to spread this art in North America if I teach you. So that started about six, seven years ago, and I've basically been trying to continue that. Uh, but did you go to Egypt for that? or? Unfortunately, no. Tickets to Egypt are stupidly expensive, but it is on my bucket list. Nice. Uh, but I did do distance learning. So I got his manual. I studied the videos. He has uh, just a wealth of information on how to do the different forms, also known as Tashlika, the rules for tournaments, great videos for tournaments, great videos to get combinations for use in combat. And I basically just practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. I will not say that I'm an expert. I'm definitely not a master, but... There is an understanding that I've developed of the art over the years of practicing it. And I do occasionally get to teach workshops or classes whenever I can. But it's a continuous process of learning and development. Hmm. So when I was looking up Hama, how does one become a master? Do they actually have to go to the place of origination and study there for like a few years under like a tutelage of 
someone native or can they just do what you did but then they do it for like years and years and years like uh how long have you been doing it okay well it, I'll, I'll put it this way right i i don't think i will ever get the title of master ever I, I, I don't think i'll ever take that title but if you did want to be a master it entirely depends on the art that you are practicing i'll give elma Treg as an example so elma Treg is a single stick double stick and two-handed stick stick fighting art that it originates in orania algeria well the modern version at least and this particular art does not have so basically the only instructors for El Matreg that are recognized in North America are people who come from Hama. And that is because we were directly taught by masters who were from Algeria, who through distance classes gave us the education. So you can amass all of the knowledge of somebody who would be quote unquote a master. But in order to actually get a title, it depends on the art. Some martial arts like Morengi are entirely based, which is I should specify, Moringi is a style of kickboxing from Madagascar. It essentially is based on your history as a fighter, your prowess as a fighter, and sort of what your age is in the group. So it's kind of like with boxing, with Western boxing. You don't really have the title master, but you have elite coaches. So in that respect, if you go out to the meetings and you go out and you fight at the tournaments and you demonstrate that you're a good fighter and then you start training guys, technically that's a master, but they don't have that title. With arts like El Matreg or modern Tartib, there, there are exams that you have to take. So for El Matreg, the only place you can be certified as a master, today at least, is in Algeria. So if I wanted to become a, an official master of El Matreg, I would have to study all three forms of it. I need to know all of the different katas, if you will. And I would need to know all of the exercises, all the combinations. And then I would have to fly to Algeria, go to Orania, or at least Algiers, and then in front of a council of masters, demonstrate... demonstrate. One, that I know these things. Two, that I know the history and the teachers and the uh, sort of who who is who, like know the names of the leaders, and then demonstrate to them that I can fight, not just with the single stick or two sticks or one large stick, but also against one or more opponents. So I'd have to be able to demonstrate that, but you can only do that in Algeria. For modern Tartib, there are different places you can go. You can go to Egypt or you can go to Paris to get certified because that's where my uh, teacher is currently based. And he runs he runs the largest modern Tartib school out of Paris. Oh, wow. And so for modern Tartib, you can only get certified if Dr. Abel Goulad himself or one of his qualified students has you pass the exam, or you can go to Egypt and do that with some of the teachers that are there. For traditional Tartib, that is entirely dependent on what the sheikhs or the sort of the elders in the community have to say about it. And unfortunately, many of them are, are, are on their way out in these days. They're trying to revive the art and spread. And there are other schools that you can go to to get, uh, to get certified in that school. But uh, that also depends. So in short, it depends on the art. Some don't have masters at all, but you need to demonstrate your prowess as a fighter and have a history. Or others are a bit more technical. And so for that, you need to actually be connected with the masters themselves and go through the exam process to get certified. Hmm. Okay. So, you know, one thing that I truly admire, though, about you and everyone in Hama is your passion to study this art that's not very mainstream in the Western Hemisphere. Thank you. Of course. So I know you're the chief operations officer. Were you also one of the founders of Hama? Yeah. Awesome. So piggybacking off of that, how did Hama officially start? Like, I know you spoke a little bit about it before, but like, did you find out about another creator of some sort who also dabbles in other African martial arts? Well, for that, we can thank this wonderful thing known as the internet. So uh, (laughs) some years ago, so I'll talk about, I'll talk about the story from my perspective, because I am by no means the first person to do historical African martial arts. That honor goes to the people who practice it now. And as far as Hama is concerned, that goes to Devon Stith, the association's president. So some years ago, I was working on a book, and the book is sort of like a Game of Thronesy idea, but it's based in Africa, or not in Africa, but based on African cultures, I should say. Nice. And so part of making that authentic is I needed to do the research on the weapons, the tactics, the cultures, and all of that. And so online, I ended up stumbling onto this guy named Damon Stiss. So I was like, who is this guy? He's using all these African weapons. He's looking really good. He has a, his research is solid. Everything he said, you know, I was able to go and research it, and I was able to find sources that would back up the things that he would say. So I knew that he wasn't just some guy who was doing, you know, Filipino martial arts in a dashiki and telling everybody it's African, which was another <laughs> problem. That, that, I'll get into that later. So essentially, we end up becoming friends on Facebook, and he launches this group on Facebook called Hama, so just single A, so H-A-M-A, for historical African martial arts. And this was a piggyback on the idea of historical European martial arts, which is a movement that had started about 20 years prior to Hama. And that movement was to review the medieval t- texts of Europe and then tried to revive the martial arts from those traditions. 
So things like rapier fencing, longsword, montante, Norse wrestling, all of that stuff, and basically creating a martial arts community around that. And we wanted to do the same thing for Africa. Because one of the problems that we realized is that there were a lot of people who were claiming to do African martial arts and either making stuff up or taking the martial arts of other cultures and then claiming the Africans were the ones who created it. Mm. And that that poses a few problems. The first problem is there is an issue of scholarship. So if somebody's just making something up, and it's not wrong if somebody wants to make their own martial art, as long as that martial art is they're intellectually honest about what they are doing. Because there are, for example, martial arts from, there's one from Suriname uh, by this individual whose name escaped me, but he is very honest. His martial art is his martial art. He looked at the techniques from European, indigenous, and African cultures from his country, and he compiled them together and created a system. And it looks like it works. It looks pretty valid. I personally haven't encountered anybody who practices it, but from my 10,000 foot view, it looks like it makes sense. But on the same note, he's intellectually honest about it being his own art. But you have other guys who, and I don't want to name names because I don't want to, you know, cause any problems. But what I will say is they will look at the martial arts of other cultures and then say, well, that has to be African. But how? What's the research? What's the background for it? And there was nobody to fact check any of that. And that's what happens when you have a lot of people who are fairly ignorant about a topic and just kind of spitballing, saying whatever they can say, right? So what we decided to do is create this hub. So the goal of the hub was to be a center where practitioners, enthusiasts, researchers, and experts can all come together and create this environment where we can share information from our various traditions, we can share essays and papers and books and sources, videotape our content, help people train so that you can go in there and actually get all of this information. And in that respect, we've been able to create this positive, healthy environment that allows people to express themselves and learn in as non-toxic an environment as we can possibly create. And so we decided beyond that, that we didn't want to just be a face. We wanted to do more. So that's when we started hosting events. We started doing conferences, holding tournaments, running classes, like and the gatherings and all of those things together. And um, so I contacted Pardon? I said like the gathering. Yes, exactly. Like the gathering. Yeah. So basically, Damon had some friends and I had some friends and we all got together and we started this organization and made it official and gave everybody positions and jobs. And here we are now, six years later. I think your mission is a beautiful thing, especially since, as we were talking before, you know, I think it's great that there is another entity that is willing to show more of history, you know, more than what we're given, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course. So one thing that I also saw uh, looking at the website is there's this thing called the Mamluk Project. One, uh, could you expound on that? And two, kind of piggybacking off of that, what were some of your favorite cultures to research? Okay, so um, we'll start with what is the Mamluk Project? So the Mamluk Project is a project that was started by Hema in about 2018. And this was to have a complete military martial arts manual translated from the medieval period to English to make it accessible to a Western audience. Um, there are a couple of other ones. There's the sort of the Valiant that is from uh, medieval Andalusia, but this will be the first one that is from African soil. The book <clears> that we're <throat> translating is called Tab al Maskhun Jami al Funun, which in English basically means the compendium that encompasses all arts. And the person who wrote it by this by, guy by this name of Bin Khazam. And it's basically a military manual for people who are training Mamluks, who were Egypt's knights. So. They would be the equivalent of a medieval knight or a samurai, but Africa, because they would be trained in all of the same disciplines and they would be using similar weapons and they would occupy a similar place in the social structure. So the project was basically to get it translated. So we started to go fund me. And we raised money from the community to help us pay for a translator and resources to help get it going. So the Mamluk Project essentially is our effort to get this thing translated. And when we started it, we had no idea how large this translation project was going to be. Because getting somebody who can translate 15th century Egyptian <laughs> uh, or Mamluk era Egyptian Arabic is really, really challenging. I liken it to imagine, you know, trying to translate Shakespeare when there are very few people who have actually read Shakespeare or even translating Chaucer. It's still English, but it's a very different English. And then when you tie in the fact that the Arabic used in that text is heavily influenced by Turks or Turkish, because a lot of the 
Mamluks, especially in that era, were of Turkic origin. So you have the Turkish language, you have the Persian language or the Farsi, you have Greek influences because a lot of things have been taken from the Byzantines and adapted for their martial arts practice. So we've been sort of working on translating this and making it an accessible, free English language text for everybody to be able to read through. And as we go through, we keep finding new things, and which ends up delaying the process of the project, but there's just so much going into getting this project translated or getting this done. So that's, that's the answer to your first question. Awesome. Um, your second question, if I remember correctly, was what were some of my favorite cultures to study? Yes. That is a big question. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, honestly, I like it all, man. I think it's all amazing. Obviously, if you've looked at my TikTok, you know that my sort of bias is towards North Africa. I like curvy swords. So sabers um, are a big thing. Definitely. Shamshirs are a huge thing. So I, I really like medieval Egypt. I really enjoy learning about the cavalry in West Africa, the Hausa specifically. I love the culture of Malagasy kickboxing. Just like all of it is just is just so awesome. It really is. And also, um, what also is awesome is what's behind you. Can we oh. Yeah, my, my weapon wall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, I, I love it. So, a sham shear is a type of saber, you said? Yeah, hold on for a second. I'll grab one. Oh, sick. There we go. Whoa. So, here we have a sham shear. So, this one actually has an interesting design behind it. This one was made by the Exotic Sword Emporium out of Ottawa, and it's actually based on a sham shear that was carried by Napoleon. Interesting. Um, so here's the story behind how Napoleon got a Shamshir. So in the 1700s, the 1790s, Napoleon fought the Egyptian campaign. It was a kind of a war over Britain, and this was considered to be the end of the Mamluk era in Egypt. Interestingly enough, you're familiar with the Three Musketeers, right? Of course. Okay. The grandfather of the author of the Three Musketeers was actually in that battle with Napoleon. Really? Um, Thomas Alexandre Dumas was oh, that's a That's right. He, he was actually... One of, the be one of his best generals. Exactly. And he was actually, uh, I believe it was his, so Haiti didn't exist as a country yet. So he was, his mother was from Saint-Domingue and his father was a French nobleman. So that's always a lovely, interesting tidbit of history I like to give that. Napoleon uh, fought side by side with Alexandre Dumas' grandfather. So this particular sword is designed after a Mamluk saber that Napoleon was fairly impressed with. So when he fought the Mamluks, he really loved the swords that they carried. So he had one made for himself so that he could sort of carry it around. And so after that, the Shamshir ended up becoming a very popular sword for generals in Europe mm. uh, because of its nature. And this is one that I use for sparring, but it is phenomenally light, super fast, and the grip really keeps it in your hand sort of just the, the way that the J grip is designed here. Uh, it doesn't offer a lot of knuckle protection, but that's where the techniques of using the sword are important. So you wouldn't do things like leaving your hand out in the same way that you have with some styles of military saber. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. So besides the Shamshir, what other uh, stuff on the wall do you, um, not, I know you love all of it, but you know, I'm sure that you have a couple of favorites besides the Shamshir. Okay, so this is probably my favorite, but my second favorite, I'll show you two. Okay, so we'll go with this. So this is my Khanjar. So a Khanjar is a dagger that is generally designed for armored fighting. It's usually sharp on one side, and it's, it's curved in nature, and a lot of that sort of helps with the mechanics of how you move your arm. The other part is it actually gets paired with a shield. I can't easily access my shields right now. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Shields generally tend to be a bit small, so you could hold, so they'd be kind of like a buckler. So you could hold the shield in your hand, and because the, the shield itself would have straps instead of a solid piece down the middle, you could just put the knife on top of the straps and hold it this way. Now you have a knife sticking out from the bottom of your shield. Hmm. Um, and sort of the way this would work, or the way it was carried, usually was on the front. So you could reach, just reach down and grab it, and it's already in position. Oh, okay, got it. Or even if somebody sort of pushes their arm against you, if you can get the blade out, now you can just turn it and use your body weight. So you can also pair it with the shield in the other hand. So say I have a shield in this hand, and now I have the dagger. If I lose my sword or my bow or whatever else, I can use this for close-in fighting. Nice. And the... The top here is designed in a way that allows you to put your thumb in here so you can put a bit more pressure on how that's on, on that when you're applying it. Is that a bear so, or a lion? Kanjad, love it. Uh, this is a wolf. That's a sick, um, what would you call that part of the of the blade? Oh, this, I mean, this would be a pommel. Pommel, that's what it is. Yeah, but that's a sick-ass pommel. Thank you. 
Uh, they tend to come in different styles. So depending on the, it was very a very individual thing. A lot of them culturally didn't always have animal motifs, mm. uh, largely because of religious reasons. Because Muslims didn't didn't believe in having animal or human depictions on things that they carried. But sometimes there'd be exceptions, especially if the culture was a bit more open. In India, for example, the Indian Mamluks or Mamluks Al Hind, they tended to have, especially during the Mughal era tended to have a lot of these animal motifs on the back of their blades. In North Africa, usually it was just like a round palm with a star on it, but then, or some other design on it. But sometimes they would have the little animal motifs. It really depended on the person. Mm, okay, got it. So this is a nimcha. So nimchas go back to around the 15th century. It's funny, I actually just wrote a paper on this a couple months ago, so a lot of this stuff is fresh in my head, so I'll try not to info dump on you. But, um, <laughs> Please do, though. So this is my training nimcha made by Street Forge Armory. Shout out to Daman. And this is a sword that is largely associated with the peoples of North Africa, heavily influenced by the swords carried by the Italians, the uh, Portuguese, and then the traditional styles of the Ottoman era and North Africa. It's like the entire Mediterranean came together to make one sword. This is based on a design from the 1600s. Uh, that's in the Met Museum, obviously with a few changes on it, because, uh, the, for example, this part here is solid connected to the blade, but traditionally it's a separate piece that gets uh, added in on top of the blade by itself. This is heavily associated with pirates, actually. In the 18th and 19th century, you would often see these paired with a pistol, the same way you would see a cutlass paired with a pistol by like pirates in the Caribbean or, or what have you, or sort of the, the typical military officer, you'll see they'll have the same on one hand and the pistol on the other. Mm. And the short design of these, uh, they're a little bit shorter than a lot of other sabers, and that is largely because... Uh, oftentimes these would be used on ships. So similar to the idea of a cutlass, if you're fighting in a cramped space, you don't want a big long sword or something that's thrust centric mm -hmm. because you don't want to get it caught on the riggings or the decks above you or what have you. Yeah, it's deadly, but uh, you need room to move. You need room to move it. And the beautiful part about curved swords, which is something that I love, is that you can still use them at very close range. And these knuckle bows are nasty. They can really pack a punch when they hit somebody in the face. But even this here, you can use these for, while this isn't the stated purpose of them, in fencing I have used these to trap other blades. Ah, uh, that's smart. So another blade would say, for example, come in here, they would cut down and then I would catch it and then push it out of the way. And you could you know, sort of put a little pressure on the hand using the grip here and sort of loosen their grip on their weapon while positioning yours for an attack. It's 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 a really versatile multi-tool of murder. <laughs> That's a funny way of putting it. Multi-tool of murder. But yeah, so in short, though, the, the, the origins of the sword is from Morocco. And so you'll see a lot of art depicting these guys, uh, especially different members of the noble classes who get their portraits done will often have a ninja on their hip. Awesome. So actually, one thing that I realized about curved swords is that they're usually used by cavalrymen. So another thing that I totally forgot to mention is the fact that uh, you dabble it, not dabble, but you study North African knighthood, if that makes sense. Or is that, I, f I forgot how you described it to me. Uh, yes. Yeah, so it's called furusia. So furusia is the general term for the martial arts practice by a feris, which in Arabic means a knight. So it's like the knightly arts of North Africa. So that would be what he would call it, Furusia. It'd be the same thing like if somebody was studying the knightly arts of, of, say, medieval France or the samurai arts of Japan. That encompasses a lot of different weapons and empty handed techniques that compile together to create the fighting discipline of a person who would be in that particular class. Got it. Did you have to learn how to ride a horse at all? Because when I think cavalry, I think horse. Yeah, I do not have access to a horse. So everything I've had to do, I've had to uh, adapt it to being on foot. So for example, some of the stuff that we study in the Mammal Treatise, I've had to try to adapt some of the lance work from spear and shield on horseback to spear and shield on foot, which so far has been pretty successful. But I mean, you also have things like in Europe, you have things like foot knights, right? So generally just sort of learning those things. So even though I'm not doing the horse stuff, I'm trying to learn all of the other things that are associated with it so until maybe one day I can actually get a horse and then, or maybe <laughs> even a donkey. If I can get a donkey, that would be fine too. <laughs> I mean, I think they'd be effective in battle because, you know, they would ride you in and then bite anything. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, knowing donkeys, they probably just dump you and leave you there. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs>
Eh, at least it tried. So actually one question that I've come to mind is Europe has chivalry. I'm sorry, what what was it called again? Furusia. Furusia. Is that also like the Arabic version of chivalry or what kind of code of laws or ethics do they go by? It's essentially the same thing. I mean, in the, in the romantic sense. Interestingly enough, sort of the romantic idea we have in the night actually comes from the Middle East. There was a man by the name of Antara bin Shaddad who lived in the years, so he was active as a knight in the years that the Prophet Muhammad, uh, if you're Muslim, call him Prophet Muhammad, was a child. They call him the father of all knights. They've made several movies about his life, but I would love to see one made in English. But essentially, he embodied all of the qualities that you would expect a knight to embody. He was brave. He fought with all the weapons that a knight would fight with. You know, the swords, the spears, the bows. He's often depicted with all of those weapons. And he was the whole protecting the honor of women, defender of the people, that whole idea of, of chivalry. So for somebody to call himself a knight in the or, or a fetus would be to abide by a code of honor similar to that of Antara bin Shaddad. Hmm. Okay. Uh, is there a certain term for that or is it just... Furusia. Furusia. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Well, Adam, I knew I was going to be excited for today's talk, but that, now that it actually happened, you know, I'm so glad that it did. So I know you got a big audience on TikTok, but I'm so honored that you at least found some time to reply to my message and uh, we could get this set up. And so even though that we found out about, you know, what you're knowledgeable about, we're now about to go into my favorite part of any big DK Energy episode, which is the bonus question round. So it's 10 questions that I wrote for you that are fun, but are still appropriate enough that you'll still have an audience afterwards. So are you ready? Let's do it. Excellent. All right. So let me just pull them up real quick. So question number one, you're given a pass to time travel to interview and study tutelage under three generals in history without affecting the current timeline. Who are they? And what's one thing you want to learn from each one specifically? Ooh, okay. Number one, Hannibal Barca. Hannibal Barca, because he was a master at doing two things. One, he was very good at making the most out of a bad situation in terms of just being able to take a smaller force and defeat a larger force in a time when numbers usually won the day. And two, his ability to take so many different groups of people who don't even speak the same language and have them work together as a cohesive unit. So that's that's what I would ask Hannibal Barca for. Another one would be Toussaint Louverture. Toussaint Louverture, the liberator of Haiti. I would want to know... Um, sort of how he was able to train a uh, sort of a group of people who weren't really given the opportunities for the most part, because there were uh, black soldiers in Haiti, turn them into such an effective fighting force that they could defeat the French, the Spanish, and the British at their own game on the battlefield. So definitely that would be somebody that I would love to study. The last person I would love to interview and learn from would be Shaka Zulu. Shaka Zulu, not just because he's a super famous guy, but because he turned a relatively insignificant small tribe into an empire in less than a decade, and how he was able to take warfare from just being sort of a ceremonial endeavor to this absolute steamroller of conquest. So learning how he was able to basically change people from being pacified pastoralists into just this massive empire. And um, if I'm correct, his strategy was called like Beast of the Horn? Yeah, it was called the um, Horns of the Bull. That's or, what I meant. Yeah, or, yeah. It, it, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't translate well to English, but essentially it's either Horns of the Bull or the Bull's Horns or the Chested Horns. But yeah, that, it's sort of, it's basically a, your, your typical double envelopment te uh, technique. Okay, got it. And also, because I'm thinking that area, if you want to do Khalid Ibn Walid, or I, f I forgot the full name, if you want to have him as a fourth, I will allow it because that guy's badass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Khalid Ibn Walid, yes, yes, please. Put him on my list. <laughs> okay, in that case, yes, he is allowed. I will grant it. Question number two, dream vacation and itinerary. There's so many places I want to go. Can I do two places? Yes. Okay, so the first place for me would probably be a combination of Morocco and Southern Spain, like in the same week. Mm -hmm. And generally it would be me geeking out at all of the absolutely amazing Andalusian era, arche uh, not archaeology, what is it? Architecture. architecture? That's yeah. the one I can I can English, I swear. Like the word passed through my head in like three languages before I got the English one. Yes, architecture. So, you know, getting to see um, some of the castles and the mosques and the churches and some of the shipyards. Also going to some of the markets where I could eat things like tangia, which has been on my list forever to try. It's like a style of slow roasted lamb cooked in a clay pot for six hours. Mm. It's supposed to be one of the most delicious things to eat lamb. And I'm a huge fan of lamb, so I want that. 
in my stomach. So that'd be the first. So I would see places like the Alhambra, Granada. I would visit wherever I could tour in the palaces that are in Morocco. I'd see all the places in terms of, and of course, I'd have to have a picnic in the desert because why not, right? Ooh, that would be nice. Be so awesome. And of course, I'd want to see a fantasia. And a fantasia, it's an Amazon sort of practice where these guys ride in a perfect line in their horses and fire a blunderbuss all at the same time. It's like a military exercise. Horses and guns and did i mention horses and guns because that's that's <laughs> the so the second would definitely be a trip to nigeria specifically so i could visit the ruins of the old kingdom of oyo so according to what i was told by my grandfather my elders my family is originally from before slavery my family is originally from that kingdom mm. so i would love to see the ruins of the old palaces some of the old trade routes and really to get a sense of what this massive empire looked like and i would definitely want to learn sort of west african style horse uh horsemanship there's this really cool thing they do kind of like tokyo drift with the horses where they ride the horse and then they'll have the horse slide on their on the on the hind hooves and they're like riding here just skirting through there there's like drums and it's, it's, it's the whole thing so uh definitely learning west african horsemanship visiting the ruins of oil and eating copious amounts of food because nigerian food is delicious is lagos in nigeria yeah Okay, Lagos yeah. is in Nigeria. Okay, from what I've heard, I heard that town knows how to party. I heard so too. I've never been to Nigeria, but I definitely want to go and party because Nigerians in general know how to party. So uh, <laughs> I'm 100% down with that. Oh, awesome. Yeah, and when I said town, that's a gross understatement because I forgot how many million people live there, but there's a good amount. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty big city. Nigeria is, I believe, the most populous country in Africa, if I remember correctly. Hmm, cool, but nice, an educational trip. I would kind of do those kind of things on my trips, you know, because I'm like, if I'm here, I at least want to know the history behind it. But so I think those are excellent choices. So question number three, what's a quote that makes you feel like you're ready to go into battle? So many good ones. I'm going to go with Hannibal's either I shall find a way or I will make one. Ha! <laughs> Love it. Short, sweet, but gets it done. Question number four. You're a leader of a military in history. Which faction are you leading? And tell me your ideal army setup. Okay, so if I was leading an army, I would probably go with Mamluk Egypt around the time of the Battle of Angelud or around the time of the Crusades. And my fellow Orthodox Christians, don't call me a traitor, but... but <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the Egyptians had such a cool army. So who I would have is definitely a core contingent of elite Mamluk horsemen. I would have a contingent of Makurian or other Sudanese archers because their literal nickname was the Ice Smiters for a reason. Cold. A side note, during one of the battles of Dongola, one of the things that, that is marked about that battle is a lot of the soldiers from the Arab army ended up going back with an arrow in each eye. They were that good. And that goes all the way back to antiquity. There was a story about King Cambyses II, one of the Persian kings who wanted to invade Makuria, which was part of that whole Cushitic area. Mm. And there's like a whole thing about him saying, well, if you can't string this bow, you can't invade my country. And they tried to invade tried to do that that didn't work out or the last story i'll add to that is when queen amon arenas sent a quiver of golden arrows to caesar augustus just before their war started mm -hmm. um and she basically said you can keep these arrows as a token of friendship but if you don't want to keep these arrows as a token of friendship you can keep them anyway because you're going to need them <laughs> so Nice. Definitely, I'm going to want Sudanese archers. I would definitely have a contingent of native Egyptian infantry, probably trained in some of the Mamluk arts, definitely some Amazir cavalry as well, some light lancers, some light cavalry. So heavy cavalry would be Mamluks. My foot archers would definitely be Sudanese. My uh, light cavalry would be Amazir because they were so good with the, with the spears and the thing on horseback. And then the rest of my infantry would be sort of native Egyptian infantry who would have been trained in... Uh, Battle of combat. Well, whoever's uh, going against you, they're toast. <laughs> Thanks. Of course. Question number five. What's your ultimate goal for Hama? The ultimate goal for Hama is to mainstream the martial arts of Africa. We want to see martial arts schools. We want to see the, the martial arts properly represented in film because there's a tendency in Hollywood, at least, to not really consult people who are subject matter experts on African martial arts. For example, movies like The Woman King, no slight to the film because it's an amazing film 
and the choreographer and the trainers for the film are phenomenal, but they practice European martial arts and they practice Filipino martial arts as the training for that. Black Panther, they had somebody who did Filipino martial arts and capoeira to do the training, but the weapons themselves were not used in a way that you would sort of see it. The best example I can give is in the Four Feathers when one of the African swords was being held backwards. Somebody should have said something, right? But if somebody's not educated, and the sword that they were using backwards also wasn't even from the region. So that was another problem. So to create a core of consultants who are able to sort of help Hollywood make more accurate depictions of African warfare and, and combat and to basically make the martial arts of Africa part of the world of martial practice and to preserve the martial arts that would be dying if we did if not I'm not going to say we as in we are the ones who are saving it but that would be dying if it weren't for the additional spotlight put on the hard work being done by the masters trying to preserve these arts. Oh yeah I mean you know that's the thing if you guys don't do anything to preserve it it's going to be gone forever which is a very sad thought, if you really think about it. Yeah, it's, it's frightening, actually, considering how much culture and history are, is tied up in those, practice, in those practices. Well, it's a beautiful thing that you're doing because you're taking on something that not many people would even think about. However, it's going back to the saying, you don't know what you got till it's gone. So thank you for keeping it around. Thank you. Of course. Question number six. What's a martial art that you don't know yet, but you definitely want to try in the future? That's a good one. I would probably definitely want to do Krav Maga. I say Krav Maga specifically because it is a martial art for the modern era. Everything I study, aside from the Filipino martial arts that I do on the side, is <laughs> so mired in ancient history that they almost have no context for their use today mm. beyond cultural exhibitions. So learning something that is practical for the modern day uh, that uses modern weapons would be absolutely awesome and I think a great asset to to what I study already. If you can find some way to add a sham shear to like a modern day strike, the other guy's fucked. <laughs> there you go. That's that's the name of the game. <laughs> Question number seven. Give me a far-fetched goal on your bucket list. I would probably say, I don't know if I want to call it far-fetched because I don't want to curse it, but I would love for my books to be turned into films. I don't know if I can be the guy to make them into films, but I definitely want to get the links for your books because um, I want to read them. Yeah, certainly, certainly. I'll send you that information, but if you're looking for my book, what I currently have published is the first in a six-part series I'm writing. It's called uh, Songs of the Sunia, Tales from the Sands of Time, Volume 1. And it's based on that sort of Game of Thrones universe I was telling you about before. And the way that the series kind of works is you follow a culture or a, or a community through about 13,000 years of their history. Going, watching the entire culture develop from the Stone Age all the way to that world's version of the 10th century. Mm. So you get to see people like fishing villages and using stone tools to having these massive palaces and gigantic armies and political intrigue and all of that. And mm. you sort of just watch the key moments in their history over those centuries. That's pretty sick. Yeah, once I get that link, I'm definitely checking that out. Question number eight. You're creating a music festival for a charity. Who is the charity and who are six of the performers? That's really good. You know what? A charity that's really close to my heart is Sick Kids. I donate to them every month and they take care of, the, of, of kids who otherwise wouldn't have the means to take care of themselves with their terminal illnesses. So I would definitely do that, and I would probably get... So I'd call Rihanna, or get Beyonce, you know, Mass Appeal, maybe Bruno Mars, because who doesn't like Bruno Mars? Right. I, I literally cannot think of anybody who doesn't like Bruno Mars. Like, he's super likable, so definitely him. Probably get some Caribbean acts, so I definitely would get Michelle Montano, who's a really big performer in the Caribbean. Destra, definitely, uh, who's another big... Uh, performing in the Caribbean. And the last one, I will probably say I'd get like an ensemble cast from the Marley family. You know what? Okay, that yeah. counts as one entity. And because you're in Toronto, if you want the weekend there, I'll add him in as like a hometown guy. Yeah, throw him in. Give me a weekend. Okay, excellent. <laughs> I think that concert is going to be absolutely lit, but I also feel like it's going to lead to a lot of birds. Because listen, if you get, <laughs> I mean, Beyonce, Bruno Mars, I can only see nine months later. Oh, uh, wow, there has been so many birds after this concert. It's like, you got some of the best <laughs> artists. Oh, and The weekend. His music is grimy, man, but it's definitely made for the right audience. Question number nine. What are three misconceptions about African military history that you want to clear up? Okay, these are big ones. I'm going to try to keep it. So I think the first is that African nations did not have effective militaries. Oftentimes people look at colonization as proof positive that these martial arts and military systems didn't work. But one of the things that we have to understand about martial arts and military history is that the ability to fight is only half the battle. Politics, 
resources, access to manpower. These are all other things that impact whether or not a nation is able to fight off another nation or even things like political intrigue. You have, for example, the whole uh, idea of like the scramble for Africa, where much of the scramble for Africa, the colonization of that period was not done on the battlefield. It was done on paper. I'll explain. So say, for example, I'm coming from, and actually perfect example, the war between Italy and Ethiopia in the 1890s. So a common practice would be if I come to your country and I want to sign a trade agreement with you, I'm going to have two contracts, one written in your language and one written in mine. Assuming that literacy is something that's important to your culture because a lot of cultures are oral cultures or symbolic cultures, right? But assuming your culture can read and write, I'll have a contract. Now, the contract that you sign that you can understand that is in your language will clearly set out the terms as we've discussed them. On my contract, in my language, it's going to be slightly changed so that you become a protectorate of my country. So then what ends up happening is I can steamroll my soldiers in and I can say, well, look at the contract. This is what the contract says. It says I can do this, that, and the other thing. And it's done in such a slow and methodical way that before you realize it, the nation's essentially been taken over and a lot of the people have either been won over or the risk of a military conflict between the two nations is just too high. So understanding that the colonization of Africa was not a result of a failure of Africa's military but more a question of a collection of factors that ended up leading to the countries ending up as part of colonies. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ones who were quick enough to realize that were able to do something about it and at least either stave it off or defeat it entirely, while a lot of other countries who frankly did not have the manpower to fight the British Empire in 1890 simply just couldn't. Another would be that African martial arts don't exist. African martial arts do exist. There are traditions, there are practices, there are techniques, there are documents, there is a documented history. Martial arts from Africa and its diaspora are a thing, they exist and they are very much alive. And uh, it's important for us to at least pay homage to them and at least give them a little bit of time in the sun so we can see sort of the, the beauty of the cultures. And so the third is one that I come across a lot, and that is that the martial arts of Asia were started by Africans. They were not. Every culture has its own martial traditions. Some of them may have been influenced by their neighbors. Some of them may have been brought in by invasions. Some of them may have been influenced by major figures. For example, how Kung Fu, as we identify it, was heavily inspired by a monk from Southern India, right? Hmm. But that doesn't mean that Kung Fu is any less Chinese because it's from China. It has the language is, you know, the various languages that come from China. The uh, cultural context is Chinese. Like it's Chinese. It's just that in the very early days of what we would consider Kung Fu, a Buddhist monk from Southern India trained his students in what he had learned in his practices as a monk in Southern India. If you get a chance to look up Bodhidharma, um, his life is super interesting. But in any case, so there's that. So African martial arts are from Africa, Asian martial arts are from Asia, European martial arts are from Europe. There was some exchange as a result of trade and conquest and warfare, but martial arts from Asia are Asian martial arts. Damn. So I'm glad that you're able to explain all that to us because, I mean, of course, we have heard about like the grand overall themes, but I've never heard about the intricacies of it. So thank you for dropping that knowledge. And Adam, this has been such a great last part to end off the show, but we're actually already at the last question, unfortunately. And it's a question that I ask everybody, but the answer is always vary. And the question is, what is your best, most recent accomplishment? My best, most recent accomplishment. I'm going to have to say this trip that I went to, I'm actually going to be doing a video about this later, but I have a colleague who runs this organization called the Immersion Labs Foundation. And he ran a seminar that was about martial arts that had been impacted by the Spanish Empire. So these are all martial arts that either fought with, were influenced by, or influenced the martial arts of Spain. And so I got to sit in a room with these absolutely brilliant masters from 10 different countries. And I got to not only share what I know in terms of uh, using the Nimcha and uh, fighting El Matreg and all the other stuff, but I also got an opportunity to see all of these different arts that in some way had a, had a similar connection. I mean, my martial arts were connected through the wars between the Christian Spanish and the North African Muslims and the Southern Spanish Muslims and all of that. But then you get to see something from the Philippines and from the American Midwest, from the Southern United States, from Colombia and all these different places. And being able to get there and share my knowledge and write the paper that I wrote about this very subject for this organization is a real feather in its cap for me. 
And I'm glad that you were able to experience all that and kind of get to see the fruit of your labor being re realized, if you will. Thank you. Of course, man. I just want to say thank you for uh, teaching me a lot about a subject that I really did not know before. I mean, African martial art history. I would have never have thought to um, even think about that, but yet here we are. And so, Adam, I know you're a busy guy, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Danny. I really appreciate it, and all success to your podcast. I appreciate it. So, Adam, for educating my audience about historical African martial arts, that's why I think you, Adam Myrie, have big DK energy. Yeah, you got Thank it. You. <laughs> I'm telling my girlfriend this, by the way. I'm going to put that, send that to her. Like, guess what kind of energy I have? <laughs> <laughs> Good. Please tell her that. But anyway, uh, folks, we're going to put all of his uh, links in the description box below, especially to Hama, his TikTok. And uh, Adam, before we head out, is there anything that you want to say or promote? Yes. So in May, on May 27th in Toronto, um, Hama... Merlin Kundisfechten, the Toronto Fencing Academy, and uh, Beit al-Assad are getting together to have an event called Day of the Saber. And essentially, we're taking the saber systems from four different countries, from Central Europe, so from Central Europe, so Austria, from England, and from North Africa, so specifically uh, the Amazigh, and from uh, Persia. And it'll be a class of saber fencing classes from those different places. So we'll be covering everything from Olympic fencing, Hessian saber, and all of that stuff in one big event where we bring the different saber fencing communities together over the different ways we can all use curvy choppy boys. <laughs> Awesome. Dang, if I had a saber, I would join too, but I kind of don't got one on me. It's all books. Nothing cool. But um, Adam, thank you again for joining the show. And that is all. I'm Danny K of the Big DK Energy Podcast, and we're signing off. Thank you.